All right, welcome everyone back to Musicians Estonia Live Talk. This is Katie, and I have a very special guest today. I have David Duncan all the way from LA. Luckily, we're on the same uh, time zone, <laughs> so it's really easy to coordinate this time. Uh, so, David, I'm just so happy to have you here today with me. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to and um, David, David plays the bagpipe. And so this is really interesting because um, uh, I've never come across somebody that has had Distorted on Bagpipe yet, even though I've read about it in research articles. So I was really excited when he reached out and wanted to do an interview. So uh, David, let's go ahead and start this off by just uh, asking you a little bit about if you can explain your background, like where you grew up, what got you into music and, and bagpipe, bagpipe playing, I can't speak today, bagpipe playing, my dystonia, yeah. <laughs> and, and um, it affects my tongue sometimes, so I'm like, ooh, <laughs> but, um, Got it. and then just uh, explain, like, uh, if you play any other instruments as well. Okay, sure. Um, um, so, yeah, so um, I'm originally from Tucson, Arizona, um, and, uh, yeah, I guess I, I got started in music when I was in second grade and my grandmother um wanted me to play an instrument i i just like i just wanted to play this like electric uh guitar toy and like jump around on stage and stuff like that she's like no you can't do that like you have to you have to play a real instrument and so you know she kind of like um signed me up for piano lessons and i started to learn like classical you know piano and stuff but um yeah i wanted to play like i was quickly drawn to like jazz though and i really wanted to play jazz but um i had like a classical teacher so um she didn't really know what to do <laughs> with me and um um so i i kept um you know i kept on with the piano lessons up until about like sixth grade which uh i had like band as an elective in middle school and i had to pick an instrument and at first i chose the saxophone because i thought it was like the cool instrument yeah but uh all i could get was like squeaks and squawks so i switched over to tuba because it was the biggest instrument and I was like the smallest kid. So I don't know, that was kind of fun. <laughs> but um, I, anyway, I kept playing tuba, but um, you know, at some point or other, I got interested in like sort of like Scottish culture. And I have this like great Scottish last name, Duncan, which, um, you know, I, I got really into like all that stuff. And um, I told my grandmother about it. And she kind of um, encouraged me to get into, uh, she'll say, I guess she signed me up for Scottish dance. So, uh, so I did like Scottish dance for a number of years and eventually I was like, you know, I actually really want to play the bagpipes. So, so, uh, I, you know, I switched from dancing to bagpiping in about like seventh grade. Wow. Um, I think I still danced for a while, but, awesome. <laughs> but yeah, so, I, uh, thanks. Yeah. But I, I, but I kept, I, I, I quit the dancing my freshman year of high school and I just, you know, I ended up sticking with the bagpipes. So. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Well, that's really great that your your family is so supportive of you on your journey as oh, well. Thank you. Yeah, my grandmother is, you know, she was always the key figure in my life who supported, you know, me in the arts and stuff. And so she, you know, yeah, really had my back when it came to um, music and, and arts in general. So. Oh, that's great. Great. And um, uh, when you were learning piano or anything, and, you know, you said you switched to uh, bagpipe eventually, was it kind of an easy transition or did you kind of have to go through a whole new like as far as like reading music and that kind of thing oh i mean well i mean as far as as far as you know like the piano to bagpipe transition like i definitely think that the piano background gave me a big advantage i mean um a lot of um beginners with bagpipe just you know are mostly drawn to the instrument because of its cultural you know, sort of identity and, and this and that. And it's, and so a musical background is, is usually, it's not always like something that beginning students have. Um, So I would say that, yes, for me, it was definitely an advantage and that I could already read music and I already had a basic understanding of rhythm and um, some of the other things that, you know, definitely help out in the beginning. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, I was going to say, because um, I was watching some videos on bagpipe playing. You guys, I had to do some research uh, before uh, he came on because I didn't know anything about bagpipes. But um, I was like, oh, how do they play? How, like, what hand positions do they use? Um, uh, what are there certain parts to that you use? And I didn't know that the bagpipe had like so many reeds involved. And it seems like it's a very complicated instrument. So I was like, beginning to learn it would seem very difficult, like, especially coming from a brass player's point of view, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's actually, that's a great point because a lot of like the most of, I'd say a lot of the things that are taught to beginning students are uh, more like technical um, aspects of the instrument. I mean, 
you know, uh, there's just such a technical component to the instrument in addition to the music. And sometimes the music actually is almost gets secondary to the technical side. So there's, yeah, there's definitely a lot to consider because it's such a complicated instrument. Yeah. And how long did you uh, play or how long have you been playing bagpipe for then? Uh, so I started when I, I was uh, 12 turning 13 and uh, I'm 35 wow, so, now. Yeah. So a long time. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, David, I, I know that you uh, eventually uh, uh, developed focal hand dystonia. And I know that really mm -hmm. sucks because for all of us, when it hits <laughs> us, it's like, what the heck? What I yeah. like out of all the things that could have happened to me? Why this? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then of course the process of like I don't even know what's going on with my hand. Like what the <laughs> heck is going on? Because it's so. Was it very like most cases? It's very gradual onset. Was it very gradual onset for you when it happened? Yeah, I want to say it was. Um, it was gradual because I remember I didn't. I didn't exactly notice until I was getting ready for a gig one time uh, with my band the freestylers of piping um we were playing at a renaissance festival in indiana and i was tuning up before the show and so was our other bagpiper at the time eli elijah wolcott um and uh he was tuning up and i was tuning up and i was just having the hardest time like playing like i just kept noticing like like this strange like art uncontrollable articulation that was occurring like whenever i would go to a certain note and like, and I thought it was a mistake because it, you know, because it wasn't, um, you know, uh, I wasn't, it wasn't voluntary. I didn't know what was going on. And I just, I just went right into like self-destructive mode, you know, really frustrated, just, you know, what, you know, and like, you know, I just had a, I had such a miserable time at that gig because there was something wrong and I didn't know what it was. And it was, it was, it was the first time that I was really conscious of it. So. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and did it, did it first appear in like your, your um left hand or um, your right hand um you know i mean i think i had started noticing um it prior to the gig but it wasn't like apparent until that day um but it yeah it's in the left hand uh it's in, it's when i play it's when i when i lift my uh ring finger on the left hand uh the the dystonia is sort of like a uh a, a, like an involuntary motion on the the, the middle finger yeah. so um yeah that's just so. really interesting that you say that because I feel like with a lot of woodwind players, when they get it, it, it is in that finger. Um, oh. <laughs> but there's like a, a couple of it or two musicians I've interviewed, uh, both, uh, or one is flute player, one was an oboe, and they both got like extension keys for that third finger because huh. it's like then they didn't have to reach so far for the key. Like it's like, I don't know, it like made it easier to for their finger to find it and push it oh, down okay. than or something like that but but i know it's good, it could, probably not possible with the bagpipe because it's like you're, you're the one of the few instruments where it's, it's like you have to cover every single hole with every single finger it's like it can't have any room for any air leaks at all yeah that's that's <laughs> exactly right i mean like even you know and i know a lot of people with dystonia have tried every different you know hand position they can to try to you know trick their brain into doing things differently and i like lately i've been practicing like at home on this thing with my with my left hand over extending over the the channel because i found that i can i can play easier this way but um unfortunately like i tried it on bagpipes and it just i can't do it because like these parts of my fingers don't cover the holes on the bagpipe as well as the pads on, on the top so it's like you know it works at home when i'm just playing on this thing but when i actually get out the instrument it's like it's just it's oh, no. it doesn't sound good <laughs> oh yeah yeah because yeah, does bagpipe have a lot of back pressure like when you're playing do you feel like a lot of air pressure? Like, I don't know how to explain it. Like when you're blowing into it, it's like very tight air pressure oh, yeah. throughout the instrument. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, there's always constant pressure, you know, always air coming out of the holes and, you know, it's, it's, you can feel the air coming off of the holes when you're playing, you know, you know blowing right back at your fingers and stuff. And um, so, yeah, there's a lot of back pressure in, in the instrument. Yeah. For you sure. have to have a, like that really subtle, like finger, uh, control over the grasp of the the openings of the holes right um it, it's it's interesting i mean like um i've always been told you know to have like a light uh light touch when i'm playing and stuff like that and like my tendency was to just really grip down you know because like i want to make sure these 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 holes are covered and like another thing about bagpipers is that we, we 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 have like a different technique when we put our fingers on the instrument i think a lot of like wind players play with their fingertips but us yeah. bagpipers, we, we play with the oh. pads of our fingers. 
So it's actually oh. like the spaces. Yeah. It's, so it's more like, it's more like in the middle of the fingers as opposed to like the tips. So like, even, even when I play like recorder, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm on the, I'm on the, I'm on the pads of my fingers. And like, I, you know, I notice other recorder <laughs> don't have the same background. So they usually play on their fingers. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Oh, that's really cool. I mean, I'm sorry. That's really interesting to me because yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that. That's yeah. so cool. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately with the dystonia, you know, as, as when I started setting in and everything, um, did you immediately, um, like most of us do, we start to over practice trying to correct things. Did you start to do that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was already over practicing anyway. Uh, like with the traditional like Scottish uh, bagpipe playing, um, there's a lot of discipline and, um, you know, sort of like it, it, it's the whole back, like the whole uh, history of like the bagpipe in Scotland, especially in like the 20th century had a lot to do with the militaries and um, they had pipe bands in the military. So there was almost this regiment to the way that practices were conducted. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of like, uh, sort of, uh, like, uh, you know, I don't know what the, the like right. Rudimentary, <laughs> like rudimentary, like, yeah. Practice, like yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah. Like discipline. Like you got to practice like every day you got to do it for this amount of time. You got to set your metronome at this, you know, speed and you got to, you know, you got to tap your foot and you know, all this it's, it's really stringent is what I was, I oh. think the word I was looking for. So. Uh, yeah. yeah, I completely understand. <laughs> you know, like they say in, in research that one of the primary things that stands out above all else is that uh, you see focal dystonia appear in so many professions where it requires mm -hmm. repetitiveness, like repetitive mm -hmm. skills, like typing, writing, like golf swinging, golf club swinging, um, any yeah. type of finger repetitiveness. And so it's, it's really interesting how I feel like, you know, th that plays a key role in almost in every single case, whether people believe it was like onset through like a, a emotional trauma or onset through like anxiety or onset through, you know, other factors as well. But out of all these multifactorials, there's always seems to be this repetitiveness involved at, at the mm. core of it, which is really yeah. interesting. Um, yeah. And then um, when you realize that things were like really bad, you're like, okay, this is, this is something, <laughs> something's going on here. Did you yeah. reach out to anyone or did you know anyone to reach out to at all? I did. About figuring out like if it was dystonia or not, or did you go get help or anything? Yeah. Um, luckily, um, I did have a friend who had been, uh, who had been, you know, sort of working through dystonia for a number of years before I ever developed any symptoms. Uh, his name is Richard King and he's a bagpiper that I've known for like about 10 years now. And uh, he'd been dealing with it for just as long as I've known him pretty much. And um, he would call me and he would just, he would be in such distress sometimes. And I had no idea what he was dealing with. And I didn't have any way of understanding. I mean, I had empathy for him, but I didn't know what he was going through. And then when it happened to me, I called him and I was like, now I know, you know, like I, I know, I know like the torment, you know, I know what this feels like now. I can't believe, you know, I, I wish I could have been of more, you know, um, you know, anyway. So thankfully I knew somebody that had been suffering and well dealing with it. And he was a, he's, he, and to this day is still like a main figure supporting me with my, with my dystonia. That's really good. That, that's really awesome that you had that type of support. Cause you know, not a lot of us know anyone to talk to when it happens sometimes. And it's, it's a bit, uh, tragic in a, in a lot of cases. Um, yeah. But um, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And um, I, I know that it's not an easy thing to go yeah. through at all. <laughs> Believe uh, me. <laughs> <yeah>. um, <laughs> but um, when you realized that you had uh, focal hand dystonia, um, did you did you find anything that was helpful to you? Like, did you find any research? Did you find someone that was able to kind of help you through the process of kind of figuring things out a little bit? Yeah. I mean, mainly, you know, I was just talking to, to my friend Richard a lot, you know, um, um, and, and at that point, like it wasn't, it hadn't really developed into something that was um, terrible. Like it was mostly just like a little annoying. I mean, you know, I would notice it. Nobody else would notice it. You know, we're good. We can we can keep on playing. You know, the gig the gig still goes on, but um, but 
when it started to become really like an impedance to like you know my ability to enjoy the music and even just to like sometimes it's it's it, it can be so debilitating that like i have trouble you know keeping time and stuff like that because it's like i can't control my fingers and need to need to stay you know stay in in, in, in time with the music and everything like then then it gets really frustrating and you know richard like always had like tips and pointers for me to like try to like um you know help myself with it but i just um i i, I didn't think it was a i didn't think it was as serious as it was until it got really bad basically yeah and, and when things reached their height was it was it just still in that one finger or was it kind of in both hands or or what uh, was the happening no it always it always stayed in the same hand it was always the same afflicted finger but yeah so yeah and it tends to feel like for those who don't know it's just like you, you feel like you don't have control over your like as your fingers are going there's just some type of lack of um consistency it feels sloppy <laughs> like when you're playing it feels sloppy it feels yeah. sluggish and yeah. um for some players it's like they their fingers start to kind of combine i don't know if that's in your case where it's like two will start to kind of go down together rather than individually. Um, and then with piano, some people start to curl. But um, uh, as you try to start uh, recovering, did you notice anything about uh, your body? Like, it, did, like you're showing me beforehand how kind of the muscles play a role in, in, in playing the bagpipe and how it may affect you in certain ways. Can you kind of explain mm -hmm. that a little bit? For sure, yeah. So, I mean, I have like sort of a mock um, bag right here. I mean, this is, you know, basically what the bagpipe bag looks like. And then, you know, the um, the channer, which is the instrument that I, that I you know, use, that I, that I play the music on, connects there. So the, the, the way, the mechanics of the instrument are that the bag, you know, fits under the arm and then the arm comes around and holds the channer so there's already a lot of like tension mm -hmm. on this arm, which, um, you know, affects like the, 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 the movement of the, you know, <laughs> like the, 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 <laughs> I don't understand the anatomy totally, but you know, what, <laughs> it yeah. affects what's going on in the fingers for sure. So, um, you know, it's been speculated that that is, you know, a cause for vocal dystonia in, you know, hand dystonia in bagpipe players. So. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And then, did you find like kind of like experimenting with it did anything help you like as far as adjusting to uh maybe playing differently or any type of adaptations help you at all oh I've, I've tried a lot of different things i mean the first thing was just like okay so you know i'm holding my hands here it's like well if maybe if i just slide my hand over a little more like it's easier and it was easier but then you know my my dystonia adapted and got used to that so then it was like okay let's just grip down harder so, you know, so there was, there was that, you know, and then it was like, but if I grip down so hard, it's really difficult to play the music. And so there was that. And then like, um, you know, at, at one point, like I tried, you know, I, I finally got the diagnosis from a neurologist that I had dystonia um, and, and, you know, I, I sought out the treatment that uh, so many people with hand dystonia do, which is uh, the, the Botox injections. And I tried that and it was a disaster because I couldn't even lift you know, the finger to play the note on a gig. And <laughs> that was, oh. that was, that was really rough. But um, I think like the last time we played out, which was uh, uh, like October of 2019, I was actually using rubber bands. And so I'd actually take a rubber band and like put it around the instrument right here. And then I would attach the rubber band to my middle finger around the back of the channer so that uh, my mobility with this finger was limited but not limited enough. So I was basically trying to mimic the effects of the Botox with a rubber band, but something that was more manageable because the Botox oh. was just, <laughs> it was too much. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It was like, you're trying to control that hyperextension going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. With, with the Botox, can you kind of show us where did they inject it in your oh, hand yeah. as far as like. So it was like, it was an injection, like right up in there, like right up at the top of my arm to, uh, you know, restrict the motion, the movement of this finger, which I think is mm. triggered by it or something. I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> yeah. The neurologist, the neurologist knew where to where to put the Botox, and she, you know, put that a like, that she did some kind of reading with an EKG, I think it was, and figured out where where the where the you know where to where to put it, and she did, and <sighs> I had high hopes, but <laughs> oh no, yeah, yeah, it did, 
That's too bad. I wonder if they like did too much or if it just was like your body was like, nope, rejecting it, yeah. rejecting it completely. Yeah. yeah. That's too yeah. bad. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm know. so sorry. But um, yeah. And it, did you then, did you, were you in LA at the time? Did you go to a neurologist in, in LA? Yeah. Then? Yeah. I saw a doctor. At, uh, yeah. I mean, well, part of the thing was, you know, like, like I just started like in 2014 or 2015, I started a new career as like a, I do like motion graphics and stuff like that. And like, you know, in 2009, I was on the road as a full-time musician and, you know, I left the road to go to school again and, and, you know, and, and, you know, get a career so that I could support my music. And so I didn't actually have like, you know, health insurance that allowed me to find like a doctor that could treat me until, you know, maybe like, you know, just like four years ago or something like that. So, you know, once, once I was able, once that door was open for me and I was able to see, you know, a, a, a neurologist who could help me with my condition, you know, um, and I, you know, I got the proper diagnosis and, um, uh, yeah, what was, I'm sorry, there was. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's okay, yeah. I was just asking if, where you went to, uh, if you could get, uh, or where you went to see a neurologist, if it was easy to access a neurologist for you. It really wasn't. I mean, and like, you know, like I said, that was, that was the occupational, like, you know, situation at the time. Like when I finally got in to see the doctor at UCLA, which is a very reputable, you know, uh, institution, then, you know, then, yeah, I felt like I'd finally gotten the help that I needed. Although the Botox was, a, it was, it was kind oh of a my disaster. Gosh. So. <laughs> how, how long did that take to wear off then? Or did it wear off completely? Uh, it was like, I want to say it was like three, three wow. months, two and a half months, maybe. So. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's strong. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have uh, Colin Sologram who's uh, writing here and he, I did an interview. He's the first, he's the first person I interviewed for the live streams like last year. And um, he's a, a, a drummer in, um, in, uh, oh my gosh, Colin, I'm messing it up. But he, he says, he says, so good to hear from another pipe band player. Our fraternity usually keeps it hush hush. Thank you for speaking. Yeah, he does Highland drumming. Oh, yeah. And um, he, he got this Tony in his hand. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I think I saw his post in the Facebook group. I think, is, is he the one who made a full recovery or something? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, because, yep. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, he's right. Like, I, I think, you know, in the pipe band world, which I, which I admittedly don't really, uh, you know take part in that much these days um it is it is pretty hush hush there's a lot of pride there's a lot of ego and uh and i think it does prevent people from like admitting that they have a problem like especially i know for myself like i was still playing in traditional pipe bands when i was noticing my dystonia really taking a hold and i was actually playing in the world championships and i was noticing it and like even the tune-ups and stuff i was trying to hide because i didn't want people to hear because you, know, <laughs> you know i didn't want people to hear that i had dystonia oh. i haven't even told yeah i quit the traditional pipe band world and i i didn't i don't think i think i had only told maybe one or two people in that community that i was what i was dealing with at the time that i quit so wow yeah oh my gosh <laughs> Well, I feel you there because, yeah, in the brass playing world, it's the same way. It's like, you know, brass players can be pretty uh, prideful, too. <laughs> <laughs> not so much yeah. horn players, but, you know, trumpet yeah. players. Not calling out any trumpet players here. But, <laughs> 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 but yeah, it is hard to talk. You know, um, it is hard to talk about this when, when it's so misunderstood. And it's hard to explain to people what it is, too, you know, how it affects us, uh, you know, physically, the emotional things we go through, the psychological processes we go through. It's just very difficult for people to talk about it and understand it because it's very, I, I get a lot of people who are like scared, like, you know, like I got one person once that was like, well, I don't want to talk about it because I'm scared. Like, it's one of those fears, like if you talk about it, maybe they'll get it, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so that's a very big fear for most people. But it's like, you think the, the, the desire to educate people on health would be more, you know, higher above this kind of limited, like illogical fear, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, think, I think too, it's like, you don't, you don't get it until you've got it. Like I, I, like with my friend Richard telling me and like, you know, really just like needing a lot of emotional support that I didn't under, you know, I didn't, I couldn't give it to him, you know, as a friend because I didn't understand what he was going through. And then when it happened to me, it, it was like, wow, like, I can't believe he's been, he's been dealing with this for yeah. so long. Like, uh, oh my gosh. And did he, did he give you any, any tips on anything that would help you along your journey? 
Yeah, actually, um, at the end of in, um, November 2019, I actually took a week off from my day job and I and I went down to San Diego and uh, Richard is like a, a, a landscaper by trade. And, um, you know, um, I basically worked his job with him um, for a week in exchange for, um, you know, his training, his retraining method for focal dystonia because he was able to um, overcome a lot of his, his hand issues. So, yeah, so in exchange for room and board at his, at his house for, for a week, I worked landscaping with him and we, we'd sit there in his truck and he would teach me, you know, how to, how to, how to, how to, you know, do, <laughs> how to retrain my fingers. And, um, yeah, so, you know, he's, he's really been there for me in terms of, you know, being emotionally supportive and then also in trying to show me his way to recovery. Although, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I have to admit like it, you know, it, it, it hasn't worked for me up until this this point and I'm still sort of uh dealing with a lot of my symptoms that I've had for for many years so oh yeah I'm so <laughs> sorry I know it's 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 hard because I feel like oh, so many recoveries it's like there are certain things in common but then there's like it's very individualistic you know kind of journey so it's like kind of um frustrating for a lot of us <laughs> well yeah for all of us it's very frustrating you know especially yeah. especially when you're going along and it's like you 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 want to find something that will really help you out but then it's like you there's so many different angles and then you try them and it's like all oh, right like nothing seems to be yeah. helping um yeah but it hasn't spread to to your other hand or any other uh limbs has it or fingers or anything um no, I want to say it hasn't. I mean, for me, it's been really acute, and then it's really only been like this one, you know, this one finger that seems to be affected. So, well, and you you're playing recorder for me. You sound really fantastic <laughs> on it, and <laughs> and you said you're playing the electric Thank bagpipe you. <laughs> too. And does does the electric bagpipe make any difference, or is it a different feel for you, or work uh, different or better for you at all? Well, you know, it's funny because like the tradition, it's this, this condition is really terrible. Like it's, it wreaks havoc on like the traditional repertoire, like, like the, the traditional repertoire of Scottish bagpiping is very like articulate. There's a lot of like, you know, grace notes and like all this little, like little finger stuff that's so mechanical and so methodical and like really regimented, you know, that military background, whatever, like, but so like, um, but in my band that I play in now, which is like a live performance ensemble, we write our own original music and we, we tend to, you know, we, we, we steer clear of like the traditional repertoire. Well, like in composing tunes and stuff, I've actually been able to like write music that sort of, um, you know, is sort of custom to what I can play um, physically. So I would say like a lot of our repertoire has evolved sort of around my limitations as a, as an instrumentalist. So. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome. Well, and I'm really happy that you brought up your band and stuff. Can you please tell us a little bit about them? I just, because I want to give you some public <laughs> PR. But oh, I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. So I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I started a band in uh, 2014 uh, with, with my, uh, with my best friend and drummer, Mike Kiebner. And um, we, uh, we play, uh, we play original compositions on bagpipes and drums. And we added bass uh, about two years ago. So we have an upright bass player who also plays electric. And, um, you know, I also, uh, also do experimentations with, uh, electric bagpipes. Uh, I invented a pickup system for the, for the double lead, um, and, uh, and I've been utilizing it with like, uh, guitar amplifiers and effects pedals. And so we've been, <laughs> we've been getting really experimental and really out there. And it's so much fun. It's just, you know, as, you know, as like a creative individual, like as an, and as an artist, the traditional bagpipe scene didn't, I felt very limited. And so like, this band has been a lot of fun. It's been a great avenue for artistic expression. Oh, I love, so. love it. I love it. I love it all. That's awesome. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I mean, I really feel like um, it's it's good that you found a way to be able to still play, you know, like, and and not just, you know, in the rudimentary style, but to go beyond that too, because I feel like, Part of the healing process well i what i find like in in most interviews is people are like yeah you to go in a direction where it's like more free playing more in a, in a more melodical way really tends to help people a lot with their recovery um and so being able to find ways to adapt and and 
and get back in that process really helps a lot. Um, and you were saying in your uh, bio that you also started learning jazz bagpipes. When did you start doing that? Yeah, so um, so I um, in, in in the freestylers of piping, I cite two major two major influences on um, the music that I write um, and my band members write in the group, and that's uh, the, the Scottish bagpiper Gordon Duncan, who is very highly regarded in the traditional community, and then this other guy uh, Rufus Harley, um, who is from Philadelphia and is a jazz musician in the 1950s and 60s who um, started out as a saxophonist but picked up the bagpipes as his primary instrument. He actually had a recording contract with Atlantic Records and released four uh, big albums with them back in the 60s. Oh. Um, really, really, you know, uh, really well-known name at the time. But um, so um, I was inspired by him because of his uh, fearlessness in taking the bagpipes to a new destination, you know, a jazz music. And um, I started listening to him back in 2010. And I just was like, so drawn to like his vision, like his artistic vision and um, what he was trying to do. And so, um, yeah, and, and, and then uh, my, the drummer in my band, Mike, he went to Temple University and studied jazz as well. He's a jazz percussion major. Um, so we all we, we always kind of like saw eye to eye on the jazz thing. But um, yeah, so 2020, uh, I, I, I got in contact with uh, with an old friend of mine who is now a music teacher living in Los Angeles. And uh, he uh, he's teaching me jazz on bagpipes. Um, uh, he's a saxophonist. Uh, he plays Barry sax. Um, we hadn't talked in years and I got on Facebook and I found him and we reconnected and I was like, Hey, I, I want to learn jazz on bagpipes. And you know, <laughs> he said, he, he said, he, he said he thought he could help me out. So um, I'm still taking lessons with, with him. That's John Swan. Uh, he's, my music teacher currently and um yeah it's it's been a it's been a fantastic fantastic journey and i feel like it's only really just begun um <laughs> oh that's incredible that's awesome and um i actually looked up uh rufus harley before we came on here because i was like oh i gotta hear this i listened to him do like a uh i think it was like a jazz version of chim 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 chimney and i loved it i was like oh this is so cool <laughs> yeah yeah he was I was just so ahead of his time. It's, it's unbelievable. Um, I've actually gotten in touch with his, um, his, cause he passed away in 2006, I think. And, uh, I'm in touch with his daughter and his son, wow. and, um, his, his former wife too. And wow. I actually played a gig with, um, with, with his son, America in Houston back in December. Um, we performed an original song that America wrote. He played trumpet and I played bagpipes. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. How lucky yeah. are you? That's so really cool. <laughs> well, and then, um, yeah, that's really cool that you said um, most of them are from Philadelphia, too. I have only been out there once, and I really loved it a lot. I actually went and visited Temple. Oh, cool. um, and, yeah, so I really liked it, too. But that's really great that you're getting into jazz and everything. And um, do you feel like uh, your dystonia has been adapting very well to it, too? Um, well, yes and no. I mean... You know, there's certain things, I mean, like, you know, like improvising in the pentatonic minor on bagpipes, which is kind of like Rufus's main, uh, main, main trick uh, in, in, in his own improvisations is not that difficult for me. Um, but like, um, but, but I'm also studying like, you know, like bebop and stuff. And in bebop, it's more about like, you know, major scales and, um, and, and, you know, more, <laughs> there's just more notes. And so that, you know, creates more opportunities for my dystonia to kind of like, pop up and um i've had to pull the brakes on actually playing jazz on bagpipes outside of like you know pentatonic minor improvisations um the bebop stuff i'm actually kind of taking a backseat on and my teacher john and i have switched over to keyboard so um yeah i've been i've been studying uh out of the abersol uh how to play jazz and improvise book uh on keyboard lately just to kind of just to kind of get my get my chops up so when I'm when I'm when I can finally pick up the bagpipes and and and, and try some try some bebop stuff I'll be ready. Oh, that's, so. <laughs> that's really great. That's fantastic. And do you yeah. feel like it's a uh, is it's easier for you to play keyboard then? Oh, I mean the dystonia doesn't you know doesn't present itself on the keyboard oh. at all. Um, oh, that's good. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not it's a non issue. I mean the thing is though I did at some point develop like a, a like a little bit of tendonitis from some of the retraining exercises that I was trying to do um on bagpipe and that was another roadblock at one point but um 
you know, I, I, I noticed that the tendonitis sometimes comes and goes on the keyboard oh, yeah. as well. That's so really interesting that you said that because, um, and I tell people this all the time because uh, they don't realize that when you retrain, you know, our, our muscles, they're, what happens when you have a dystonia is that there's this misfiring brain signal. Mm. And what happens is there's like, and to create flowing muscle movement, you have to have like a tag antagonist and antagonist muscle working together smoothly. But when this fires signal is misfiring, what happens is the muscles start to fight each other. So we have these kind of like spasms. Well, especially in brass plant, embouchure is starting these spasms. And so to try to control, to resist, to go in between that like you know messed up signal it causes a lot of muscle exertion so it's re really wears <laughs> on us more than we even realize because it's like you're fighting this inner battle but not just mentally but physically you're like like yeah. i gotta find a way to make this work without overdoing it yeah. but it's still very taxing so <laughs> i like you i think it was three years in my retraining i started to get um like signs of tmj in my in my uh, jaw joint where one side of my oh, face, wow. it was like starting to really tense up near my muscle jaw joint. And it was because during retraining, I was just overworking that side of my face, like oh my that gosh. jaw, the joint in my jaw. And so I was like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> I can't believe this. And it was weird because it was like things were getting better. Things were improving really mm -hmm. fast. But all of a sudden it was like, oh, I have something with my jaw. So it's like, yeah, oh, yeah a lot of people don't realize that um, you can – you know, it's it's so hard to retrain with dystonia because it, it does require a lot of muscle exertion to to get past the symptoms or to work with the symptoms in general. I mean, it's not just something you can stop. Yeah. It's like you have to either like resist them a little bit or go around them somehow or adapt. But even the adaptations are really exhausting, yeah. you know, on our bodies. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you find that, um, is there any type of uh, physical therapy or anything that kind of, any type of physical exercises or anything you do that helps you? Um, I, I mean, I haven't really found anything that, <laughs> I, I mean, I haven't found anything that really helps. I mean, um, the, the retraining that I was doing with, with my friend was working, um, although it was very slow. It was a really slow process. And, um, you know, I, 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 I I, I was at it for, you know, for months, you know, maybe five or six months before I developed the tendonitis. And then when the tendonitis hit, it was just, it was, you know, I had to pull the brakes on that. And so I got into physical therapy and they were treating my tendonitis and I told them, oh, I have focal dystonia. And they said, well, let's try some things for that too. And we tried all that they could suggest. And, you know, it was all about like posture with them and posture stuff didn't work. And I was just getting more and more frustrated and like, um, you know, but finally, you know, once the tendonitis was cured, I went back to the, back to the, you know, the muscle retraining on the fingers and, and the tendonitis came back. And I don't know, then I tried like, um, Alexander technique. I, I think I had a few private, you know, private like sessions with an instructor and that, and that was really cool. One of the really most innovative, you know, approaches to like, um, posture that I've ever heard of. And I thought that was promising, but oh wow. Yeah, a few months, few months later, and I'm kind of back. I feel like I'm back, back where I started again. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I I hear the frustration. Yeah, because it's it's um, it's one of those things where it's like um, you know, I try to explain to people like with dystonia, it's like um, someone else in an interview put it really well. They said it's like imagine if you're trying to deliver the mail to a house, but there's a dog in the yard, and it's like you have to kind of like every time you come around, you have to kind of trick the dog because the dog's gonna figure out like even if you find a pathway that works to the house, the dog's going to pick up at it at some point and, and follow you. And um, it's, it's just frustrating because it's like you're constantly adapting. You're constantly trying to find a way around this until eventually the brain picks up is like, Oh, you're creating a new pathway or something. Um, but yeah. it, it's just, it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult. It's very tricky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know that um, yeah. um, Colin, who commented, he was saying that um, when he retrained, his uh, occupational therapist made him just carry the drumsticks with him around as he's walking, like just out <laughs> doing business or exercising or something. Yeah. And he said that that really helped him because it just made his body realize that he wasn't holding a drumstick, you know, it, he wasn't in yeah. drum playing mode. Yeah. Um, do you feel like there's... Um, anything that causes your dystonia to flare up when you're doing other tasks like typing or um anything to do with the finger no. movements 
I, I really haven't noticed it. Um, I, like, I think I heard the term task specific mm -hmm. when I was doing research on dystonia. And I mean, for me, that, that's very much the case. Like, it's really only when I'm playing bagpipes. Like, it's less noticeable on recorders sometimes, you know, and then I play another set of bagpipes called the German medieval bagpipes, also known as a doodle sock. And like, huh. with that, it's, 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 it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's ever present. I mean, at this point, but yeah, you know, like in some form or other, like, you know, it, it, it it's less on other instruments. I don't know. I play bass as well. Like I, I've never had any problems playing bass ever. And that, that just adds to the frustration. Oh, <laughs> oh. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, it's, it's okay. I actually, um, at one point, I think three years ago, I had decided that I was just going to quit playing bagpipes and, um, we needed a bass player and I was just gonna, I was just gonna be the bassist in our band and, um, uh, <laughs> our bagpiper. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it's like, nope, there's no escaping it. I gotta, I gotta stick with the bagpipes and, um, yeah, but you know, I, I, I'm, I just love the instrument and I, you know, I, I don't ever want to quit playing. It's, it's just, it's, it's, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm in it for the, for the, I'm in it for the long haul. That's so good. <laughs> Good. That's good. And I think I think that was ha meant to happen for a reason. I swear <laughs> that's meant to happen for a reason that you, right. you did that playing it again. Because yeah. I feel like that's what happens. You're, all of us are like, I gotta. I try to sell my horn. I think <laughs> after I got diagnosed, I try to sell it, and nobody would buy it. And I was like, Oh, are you kidding me? Like, but I'm so happy that I got it. You know, back and stuff. Because it was like, you just can't. You know, let it go. It's just too much. Yeah. And I really do believe yeah. that you know when there's a will there's a way and i i know yeah. that you know as as long as you had it and i know it can be frustrating but i really truly believe that you you will find a way in time and and um it just comes to you in little little bits <laughs> and pieces here and there over time Thank you. yeah Thank you. it really <laughs> does i mean i think i think i after my uh, cause I, I was recovering for three years and it was going really well. And then I got that TMJ like mm -hmm. in my face and I was like, Oh my gosh, I can't play at all. Cause mm -hmm. I would like literally blow in just my mouthpiece, which, you know, doesn't take any physical effort yeah. and it would start flaring up. Yeah. And then I was like, Oh, okay. Now I can't play at all. Like I never again. <sighs> um, and then I was like really depressed, but, um, you know, yeah it's it's weird how it's like as soon as you like walk away from it it has a way of bringing you back <laughs> and, and, and that's what happened to me i was like okay i, I have to find a way around this i have yeah. to you know <laughs> so. yeah yeah and it's it's like even even with my band right now it's like we're we're looking at potential gigs you know at the you know in the second half of the year and we had rehearsal we've, we've we started to rehearse again recently and um you know i i talked to mike you know and i was like hey you know like I, I'm just going to write a list for you of the stuff that I can do right now. And, um, and, you know, and that's, and luckily, you know, I work with some really incredible people who understand where I'm at with this thing and they're willing to work with me as well. So we're, you know, making a set list, you know, basically, you know, tailored to like what I, I'm able to do right now. And I, you know, I'm super grateful to have their support for sure. Oh, that's great. And I'm just so happy that you're playing music too uh, within a band. I just have to say that because not a lot of us um, uh, can, you know, not a lot of us do get to do that again. It takes uh, years to to be able to play in a band again of, of any sort. Um, and to have the confidence too, because I feel like a lot of people deal with the psychological blockages. So it's like they might be able to play still a little bit, but then they don't want to because of the psychological, like, you know, anxiety of going on stage with with it you know yeah oh that definitely does wreak a uh, psychological havoc i mean that's for sure like being in front of an audience and, and 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 trying to do what you do best and then you know knowing that you're not doing it at your full potential and just you know and like what i've realized though is that a lot of that is just in me like i'm expecting the audience to hear my imperfections and you know and to judge me but really it's me it's just i'm the only one who's like beating myself up over over what I can you know what I can't do so <laughs> that's so, so good that's so well said that's so well said I completely <laughs> agree you know we're a lot harder on ourselves than than people are to us you know in the audience yeah. and stuff yeah but I yeah. mean just listening to you play recorder you know even beforehand <laughs> too it was just like I love it and I'm so proud of you and I just, yeah. I, just I, I feel so much hope oh. for you too because I mean 
Um, yeah, I've seen it a lot worse. So. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. That's really encouraging. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, David, before we go here, is there, I, I was going to ask you a couple more questions and these are just going to be kind of like uh, fun questions. So, and okay. also kind of broad, so you'll have to excuse the broadness of it. But um, my yeah. first, first question is if, let's say if, um, this is more inspirational, but if somebody came to you, like, you know, like you did to your friend, he came to you and said, hey, I have, I'm a big, big pipe player and I have dystonia in, in my hands and um, what, what should I do? Like, what is some advice that you would give them? Oh man, uh, first and foremost, find your, find your emotional support. Like find somebody that you can lean on, who, who will understand what you're going through, and be there for you when you're when you're when you're going through the psychological, um, just you know, trauma of what it's like to have this. Because you know, yeah, it really helps to have somebody in your corner who who has been there and understands. And you know, I was really fortunate to have that. You know, with my friend Richard. Uh, so, yeah. Well said. Well said. And then um, secondly, you already told me what um, one of your favorite bagpipe players was, uh, Rufus Harley. Um, is there any other bagpipe players that are your main source of inspiration? Look up Rufus Harley. That's all I got to say. Look him up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen to, listen, to, listen to Recreation of the Gods. It's, 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 a, it's a classic. Um, all of his Atlantic albums are pretty incredible, but I mean, like he really Pressed himself as an artist on recreation of the gods and it's 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 a classic <laughs> that's great i gotta do that too yeah. i'm gonna go look yeah. it up <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and last but not least my last question is um name one thing that has helped you get through this pandemic <laughs> oh geez oh music lessons <laughs> no you know what it is is uh, my music teacher john has put together a practice group we meet Monday through Friday oh. from noon to one and it's called the artist practice group and we get on zoom and we introduce ourselves for you know we just at the beginning we share you know you know what we're going to do for the hour what our intention is and then we all just turn our microphones off and keep our cameras on and we practice and at the end of the hour we come together and we either share the revelation that we had while we were practicing or we share a selection of music that we worked on or we just you know just say hey I don't feel like sharing today but the whole point is to like keep practicing and like keep each other accountable and so that's been that's that's what's helped me get through the uh the pandemic is just that devotion to uh practice every every day with the practice group online wow oh, oh my gosh what a great idea that's awesome <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a great idea maybe we should do that with musicians with dystonia i wonder if anybody would be interested in that but i know it would be kind of messy wouldn't it like <laughs> but if we have our audio off if we have our audio off maybe you know i don't know <laughs> i don't know yeah, how that yeah. would work <laughs> it's cool it's cool because you know you don't feel like you're practicing alone and um you know it's 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 really nice so yeah we'll see about that i'll see if i can get something going there i think that would be really cool for those interested in it yeah, yeah. <laughs> well david it has been such a pleasure talking to you and i've been so excited to learn about the bagpipe but most of all just hear about your journey and i have to say thank you for sharing it because um um even though it, it's easy for some um for others it's very difficult to open up about their what they're going through or even they're at a stage where they're not they're grieving and they can't open up about it yet you know or talk about it or even or even admit that they have it to themselves you know it's very difficult um so i mean this is the really important work that you're doing just speaking out about it and um I have to say what inspiration is, and I hope that you come to find how much it is changing the trajectory. I can't say that word, trajectory <laughs> of musicians' health in the future, just being open about your story. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, David. Well, we'll have to do this again soon, okay? All I right. hope that you'll be <laughs> up for another interview at some point. Definitely. I look forward to it. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye, David. <laughs>